Good morning. I'm very glad to be here. I want to thank the, the organizers and also the, 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 the Hertzberg Foundation. Really good to see you all. Uh, I'm here today to, um, to talk, share three things with you. There is a bodily fluid that is companion to blood, to robospinal fluid, bio juice that exists in our body. And secondly, is work in the last decade has been developing or, or, or the emergence of biomarker or molecular constituents in this biofluid that is being advancing for clinical uh, utility. And thirdly, is that these molecular constituents is being credentialed mechanistically, scientifically, how distal organs from the oral cavity could be linked uh, through, through, you know, uh, through these molecular you know, uh, pathways in reflecting uh, diseases. So on that note, I'll, uh, my, I need to disclose that I have a virtual uh, company that I, I formed with University of California, Los Angeles, and I'm also consultant to GSK, Wrigley, and, and Colgate Palmolive. And so there was a vision. There was a vision 10 years ago by one of the 27 institute at the National Institute of Health. The National Institute of Dental and Craniofacial Research invested a decade ago to do one thing, and that one thing is to turn saliva into a clinical reality. And, and one of those initiatives is, is towards, the, towards two, two two frontiers, as I consider, that, need, that necessitate that's, that reality. One is the ability to translate these molecular constituents in saliva towards definitive, pivotal evaluation and validation, as Dr. Simone talked about in the biomarker in, you know, endeavor. Secondly, is the ability and necessity to credential these molecular constituents, how how when disease, especially distal to the oral cavity, when they developed, there could be signals that are shed, shuttle, and reach salivary gland, and then contact, uptake, reintroduce to the saliva as, as biomarker or molecular constituents that, that we need to be embarking upon. So I'll touch on these two, and also that portfolio of credentialing or developing saliva biomarker during, during my short talk this morning. Most of the work has been published, and I'll be glad to elaborate if there's a need to do so. Um, so, you know, a, a quick refresher, saliva comes from, is there a pointer here? Is it the red one? Oh, here, right here, I see, right in front of me. So saliva comes from three major pairs of salivary gland, as we all remember. Now, interestingly, as it turns out, salivary gland and, and the pancreas shares commonality embryologically and developmentally. Okay, many of you know that pathologists sometimes is, 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 is you know, mistaken by the parotid gland how similar it is to the pancreas, except that they don't have the eyes of the Langer hands, of course. So these three pairs of salivary gland, the parotid, some mendium sublingual, collectively in a pairwise manner on a daily basis produce a liter to a liter and a half of bottled water. There's a bottled water right there. Could you hold it up, please? Right in front of you. Hold it up. That's about. 500 microliter, milliliter, and three, two to three times of that comes into our oral cavity every day, non-invasively, non-painfully, and non-embarrassingly, and carries with it these molecular constituents that share with, with blood, cerebrospinal fluid, and other body fluid. So if we look at the question a little deeper, where does the juice come from in saliva? Is the capillary that nurture the salivary gland, this is a typical salivary gland, the SNI cells, the ductal cells, there are active, passive, and secretory mechanisms that pose fluid and analyze from the vasculature into the capillary space and, and through the lumen into our oral cavity as whole saliva. We now have tools, skill set, and technology that can harness these molecular constituents and, and decipher uh, these, these molecular signatures and fingerprints that can allow us for, for clinical utility. So, so this imagery is important because that perhaps is where Charlie Strickfitz 14 years ago found her to new a breast cancer marker in the saliva of breast cancer patients. It also allows us to speculate what other disease that have circulatory biomarker that could, that could come into uh, you know, saliva space and into oral cavity and could be harnessed for, for clinical utility. 
So on that note, this past decade has led to a number of scientific outcomes that begin to credential the saliva constituents for clinical utility. The first and foremost is the deciphering, the cataloging, and the annotation of the saliva proteome. The periodic table of the saliva protein is now known. There is 1,166 protein in healthy people's saliva. If you look at this Venn diagram here, about two-thirds of the proteins are common between the parotid fluid and the combined submandibular sublingual fluid, and yet about a third of proteins are unique in, in, the, in the submandibular sublingual fluid and in the parotid fluid. This body of work was concurrently being, being done by a group of UCSF with Susan Fisher, John Yates at Scripps, and also my research group at University of California, Los Angeles. And this really presents the first milestone, an important milestone towards the, the translational you know, uh, utility of, of saliva, and, and that body of work was, was, was published five years ago. We have since morphed, advanced these these, these, these outcome of utilizing the, the saliva constituents into this site here, we call the saliva omics knowledge base. Basically, the omics information that endowed in, in tissues and body fluid is very much you know, present in saliva. In addition to the proteome, if you come to this site here at www.skb, which stands for saliva omics knowledge base.ucla.edu, is an open access site, and you will see that if you click on this button here, you will go to that site where all the saliva protein will be, will be listed, and, and there are four additional diagnostic constituents, or alphabets as I call them, that have been developed in, in my laboratory at UCLA, including the transcriptome, the microRNA, the metabolites. We've just published a paper with Professor Basaro Tomida at Keio University of a, a profile metabolites that are present in healthy people's saliva, and, and also in the, the microbiome constituents that are present in saliva as well. So not only do we have the proteome, we have five with four additional diagnostic constituents that we can cast into the saliva of individual with a disease phenotype. For example, pancreatic cancer, that, that using informatics and statistical tools and also the diligence of, of a biomarker development study begin to harness and, and realize the, 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 the molecular signatures that may be present in this adjacent biofluid that could be used for for early detection or for monitoring of therapeutic efficacy uh, of, of, of the disease. If you click on this button here, you will see there's a host of technology that was funded by NIDCR towards the eventuality of using a drop of saliva that could be used in a communal clinic or in a dentist's office or a, a clinician's office to monitor the, 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 the early indications of, of, of the disease or the therapeutic you know, you know, uh, 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 efficacy as well. So, so this is an open website. I welcome you all that if you're not doing anything fun on a Saturday night, Come and visit the site and you will see that saliva is a late comer, but it's, it's catching up and we, we made the effort to assemble this information that you can actually begin to do uh, experiment in, you know, in silico in the comfort of your, of your own setting, so to speak. This is really the heart of biomarker development, no different in blood, but it certainly is important to adhere to the diligence in saliva. Uh, upon recognizing a disease of interest, there are a host of these biomarker, you know, alphabets as I call them, the proteome, the transcriptome, the metabolites, and of late the methylomics that we can begin to cast into the saliva here, adhering to the diligence of a prospective design. That we need to have a clinical context where the markers are gonna be utilized identifying and procuring these clinical samples and then utilizing these technologies with, with, with statistical informatics tools, then we need to advance the value or the validity of these markers towards a series of steps of validation. Uh, a preclinical validation, uh, like a pilot setting, and then the eventuality of advancing them to the doorstep of of really the FDA because anything short of that would remain as academic curiosity. Without the credentialing, these markers will never advance into clinical reality. So the ability to do so is important and the diligence really is on us as industry begin to take on a different behavior that, 
that, that, that, that we need to have this, this risk-averse capability before they would take on and develop them into perhaps clinical products. What is of interest is that NIH begin to have mechanism that, that comes into place that serve, as I, as I think of it, as academic FDA evaluation. So, so, so those mechanisms are in place and we have the capability to, to cast these multiple tools. So, so the value of multiple capabilities is that if you have one, one you know, it's like going fishing, if you have one line is good, but if you have multiple capability to do so, you, you enhance that capability of harnessing that molecular signature. What is of interest as we develop this portfolio of saliva biomarkers is that the transcriptonic component, the extracellular RNA, has always been in our, in our, in our work. We actually published our first paper in 2004 reporting, you know, the extracellular RNA for head and neck cancer detections. And is of, it is gratifying that two years ago, many of you know that NIH Common Fund is, is developing significantly a program called extracellular RNA in communication. So RNA is no longer has to be confined within a cell, but to be transcribed and translated. There, there now exists outside a cell that serve as, 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 as signaling moieties hormones like hormone or exocrine function could be in free form or encapsulated in this lipid bilayer called exosomes. So this landscape is developing. They recently just funded, you know, about 25 projects in this, in this area here. Um, and, and we were fortunate to have one of those for, for saliva extracellular RNA development for gastric cancer detections. And, 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 and one that just emerged two weeks ago to comprehensively decipher the extracellular RNA in bodily fluid, including saliva. So we were, we were gratified for that. Now, what I would like to share with you in the remaining time my talk is the early work, okay? Early work that we did with, with James Farrell and also with my colleagues at UCLA and Cedars in, in, in utilizing these tools for, for pancreatic cancer detection. Again, I want to stress these are early work. It's towards that pre-validation scenario. Obviously, the journey lies ahead of us. So in a clinical context that all of you are familiar with, we, we, we harvest and procure a clinical sample prior to symptomatic individuals that would have an endoscopic you know, ultrasound evaluation and, and collect the clinical samples and develop saliva biomarkers based on these clinical samples. So the, the work that we, we did so far is using a, a extracellular RNA approach, a proteomic approach, and a microbiome approach. The outcome of the study design is briefly shown here. This was published using a discovery cohort and utilizing a transcriptomic microarray and a proteomic approach for microbiome evaluation, followed by a validation using a pilot cohort of 30-30 of pancreatic cancer, uh, chronic pancreatitis, and, and non-disease individuals. These outcomes were reported in, in this paper here about two years ago that the most discriminative you know, um, uh, constituents in saliva, these individuals, consist of four transcriptomic markers that are listed here, including KRAS and methylation binding proteins, and have the clinical performance that is being shown here. So, so these are encouraging outcome. Again, I would stress them encouraging because these are, these are really pilot data. The real importance is to advance these markers towards definitive validation. We also have looked at the microbiome, the 700 different microbial species that coexist in our oral cavity, and two of them, you know, uh, Nigeria elongata and Streptomyces collectively have this level of clinical performance that, that we're, we're encouraged about. Again, you know, um, the, the work that we're currently collaborating with, with our colleagues at Cedars is to advance these marker collectively in a clinical setting where we could engage in a definitive academic uh, FDA level evaluation. So we're looking for that, forward to that, the scientific frontier. I'll quickly go through that. How does, how, what, what connects the pancreas and the salivary gland? The exosome becomes a viable working model. A paper was just published in, in, in Journal of Biological Chemistry linking using an animal model when pancreatic cancer developed, working with uh, Ebo Guido, Guido, Ebo, um, that there are these, these signals that are shed and biomarkers are being, being, being produced and reflected in saliva 
and, and through these exosomal content. The validity of demonstrating exosomal content is to suppress exosome biogenesis selectively by transfecting a dominant negative form of a vesicular you know, biogenesis moiety, rep 11 and what we see here is, I'll go to the next slide here, is, is that there's a restoration to normalcy of baseline upon a dominant negative scenario. So I'll end with this slide here, and really it's a glimpse into the future that we, we looked at the capability of when, when disease developed in an organ such as a pancreas, you know, signals are being shed in normalcy as well, not only in pathology, that, that are through vasculature that can reach salivary gland, and upon reaching a salivary gland, contact uptake, reintroduce, and while most people think saliva is being spit it out, but it's being swallowed, and the thought is, what does it do? Okay, what does it do when it enters the stomach, the esophagus, and into our GI tract, where 70% of the mucosal immunity lies here in the distal ileum, the gut associated lymph tissues, the, the, the pious patches, the initial discovery of exosomes, the communication with B and T cells. So on that note, I'll stop. Thank you very much.